Welcome. I'm Bernice Frost, the CEO and President of Brokerage Up and RealEstateCoach.com. And my name is Greg McDaniel. I'm the co-host and co-founder of the wildly famous and successful podcast, Real Estate Uncensored. But today, Bernice and I come together and we are Real Estate Coach Uncensored. Well, as we wrap up this crazy year we've been in, we have an awesome show for you. It's called 10 Strategies for Being More Profitable in the Upcoming Year. And one of the things that's kind of out there, you know, we hear everybody talks about GCI, gross commission income, or how much they did in sales, or how many sites they did, or how many transactions they did. But that's one piece of the profitability puzzle. But the piece most people miss is how they can be more profitable by working smarter and cutting their expenses. So we're gonna give you 10 strategies for doing that. So guess, get strong on doing your revenue, but on the other hand, you wanna make sure that you are paying, you know, uh, I heard one guy at a conference say, well, he did a million, you know, he made a million dollars in revenue, but he spent $950,000 in expenses with his team and all the other marketing he was doing. Need I say more? So no. let's begin this process then. The first step is to calculate how much you earn per hour. So you can take your, uh, you know, what you can do is look at your Schedule C on your 1040, or if you file an LLC or corporate tax return, what you're looking at is your net income after expenses, okay? So what, you know, what did you make after your expenses? That's your net income. Now, take and divide it by $2,000. So if you work, and that comes from 40, working 40 hours per week, 50 weeks, so 2,000 you know, hours that you work each year. So this is your after-tax hourly rate of profit per hour. Now, the question is, how much did you make per hour? And the first thing you need to look at is, are you making more than minimum wage? If you're making more than minimum wage, then are you doing things like filling brochure boxes, dropping off dry cleaning, addressing mailers? You're working for minimum minimum wage. You want to mm -hmm. shift your business. Now, Greg, how much you know? How much are you making per hour? And what have you had to delegate or shift to get there? Sure, uh, not a problem. Uh, my father, back in 2009, I'm going to say, built me a spreadsheet that he that he put together, and it analyzed the minute the hour, the client, the, you know, everything down to the penny. And it showed that I was, when I was doing prospecting, I was on, on average at that time, I was worth $1,200 an hour. And wow. I was, it was astonishing. You could adjust different things to see how you would be able to be efficient. And it would, it opened my eyes so dramatically because I was an avid door knocker at that point and a cold caller, still am. And it showed me, oh my gosh, like this productive, this productivity right here is worth more than anything I could possibly do. So what I did is I assigned a lot of the paperwork and a lot of the, you know, brochure boxes and stuff like that out to my admin, out to my team, other people on my team. And my job was the prospect at $1,200 an hour. That's more than doctors and lawyers and attorneys put together by making cold calls. When they say it doesn't work, they're full of you know what, because this is such a powerful use of time. And once my eyes were opened up to it, I never looked back. And again, this is understanding what your strength is. And Greg, you're really good in that cold calling, you know, and getting face-to-face -face door knocking space because of all the work you've done in that area. But I, you know, I, I didn't realize what the impetus was for you. And it was just looking at the numbers like we're talking about, you know, right now. Right. Now, the second thing you want to look at is eliminating non-productive opportunity cost. And the classic example is the buyer that you take out, you know, and you show them 20 houses and they don't buy anything. Okay. Ugh. So when you're out with that buyer, you lost the opportunity to cold call, prospect, to do an open house, to stay in contact with your sphere, do a coffee with the past client. You lost all those opportunities. So Greg, you had a recent example of this in your business. 
Yeah, I did, Bernice. And it's actually was, it was a very uh, interesting com uh, conversation I had because I was, I'm dealing with some issues on a, one of my 2.1 million and my $5 million properties right now. And I just said, I, you know what, I, the paperwork, it sucks the soul out of me to do the paperwork. My team manager, Eileen Landon, God bless her soul. She's absolutely amazing. She handles a lot of the paperwork and she is licensed. So there's no, no problem there. And so I delegate it to her and I say, Eileen, you handle this, deal with it, and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to handle some other stuff. I'm going to get another you know, couple million dollar properties listed. And I, I went to my strength because my strength is getting together with somebody, having a cup of coffee, having a beer, having a lunch, whatever it's going to be, build a relationship. Her strength, she would rather you know, pull her fingernails out, then have to do what I do. And I'd rather pull my fingers out, nails out without having, you know, versus having to do what she does. But we understand that and we work well with that. And so I just say, Eileen, do this. She's like, got you. She's like, Greg, you do this. And I say, gotcha. And we're done. It's interesting that you talk about going out to get more business uh, because you need to treat your listing appointment and your prospecting time, you know, treat them equally. So if you would cancel your your listing appointment at a particular time, then you can cancel your prospecting. But if you wouldn't have, that's the filter to use. And then of course, buyers are the furthest, you know, they're down at the bottom. But again, this feeding your pipeline is really important. Now this leads into number three, which is focusing on referrals and, you know, what the latest National Association of Realtors study says, 67% of the listings come from, you know, they come from your sphere, someone you've done business with, or someone who is referral in your sphere. You know, again, this is an important thing to focus on. Now, Greg, I know that you actively do a lot of work generating referrals. Give us an example, kind of update us on what you're doing. You know what, one of the things that we're doing that's really, really powerful right now is that I'm posting on Instagram and Facebook stories on a consistent basis. And I do, and I've talked about this in other articles, uh, I do a personal post and I do a business post on a daily basis as much as I can. Uh, and then what I do is I go back and I see the people that are consistently there watching the videos. And I do a simple DM, which is a direct message for all you guys who aren't up to speed on that. Um, and I just say, hey, Bernice, Thanks for all watching all the crazy stuff I put out there. How's life? What's new? Would you like to get a cup, cup of coffee, a beer, or lunch? I can't tell you, guys, I cannot tell you the power in doing this. I am getting hundreds, if not thousands of views on my page, as my, on my stories as I go along, because I'm building up the, the, the audience. And the people who respond back, they're falling off the trees when it comes to referrals based upon one fact. I'm being human. I'm just saying hi. So this goes back to the way you generate referrals is by connecting with people on a one-to-one -one basis. Great takeaway for everyone, Greg. Let's go on to number four. Profit is always temporary. Now, you may not have heard that before, but you know, all I have to say, if you've ever been out sick for a couple of weeks and all of a sudden you can see you didn't get any deals. <laughs> but each quarter, what we want you to do is to challenge your assumptions about, you know, with new ideas, new niches, new processes. So you're always looking for something. You know, the thing I know about top producers, they are listening to podcasts, they're watching videos, they're driving their car, they've got, you know, I mean, you're smiling. They're always looking for that edge. You know, that's just how they stay there. So be willing to invest, you know, one to 5% of your time in making mistakes, trying something new, doing strategic planning, you know, learning new ideas. Now, Greg, you have something new that you're going to try, you know, starting in January. What is it? You're, you, uh, Bernice, I found, I actually downloaded it this morning, guys. I cannot wait to start using it. And I completely agree with what you're saying, Bernice. Um, you know, I've been, uh, I, I've got rid of uh, the radio years ago, got tired of listening to the newest pop song 10 billion times on the, uh, on the radio. And I went to podcasts and audio books and stuff like that. And it's, I call it the asphalt university, because when you're out there driving around, um, you can get a master's degree if you listen to a, a book or a, a podcast 30 minutes a day, you know, to and from work or whatever else it is. And so I, I, I found this new app today, guys. It's an app called Stereo, um, and it has a, like an orange mic on it. 
And what it is, it's an opportunity where you can go build an audience and talk about whatever you want to do, whatever you want to talk about, bring people in and stuff like that. I, I think there's got a lot of legs to this thing. Um, and I'm going to start using it consistently and persistently because I think that everybody needs a platform. And if you don't want to be on camera, cool. But I think this is a great opportunity for you. Oh, Bernice, and I forgot to tell you, this is an avatar-based app. So you don't have to have your photo on there. You can create whatever image that you want on it. You literally don't have to show your face. You just have to talk and be an expert in whatever you're going to talk about. And I think it's absolutely brilliant. Okay, let's go on to number five. Limit your marketing spend to 10%. And this is just a rule of thumb that's been out there for many, many years. In terms of how much your marketing budget is, it is 10% of your gross revenue. So if my GCI was ten thousand, you know, was a uh, hundred thousand dollars, I would have ten thousand dollars to spend on marketing. And the question is, where is it best spent? Mm -hmm. And the great thing is now, as Greg's talking about, there are all these free apps and opportunities. There's things on video, those are just time intensive. They are not cost intensive, but you've got to weigh how much of your time, this is the opportunity cost formula. Do you, get, you know, spend time doing video when you could be prospecting? You know, do you spend time doing, you know, a podcast when you could have been prospecting or doing something else? So the question is, where's the balance? Now, I love number six, buy in bulk. Okay. Greg, you want to talk about this one? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I do actually. I mean, we're all doing it these days just due to COVID. Oh, man. This toilet paper got everybody going. <laughs> um, I was in Safeway the other day, yesterday actually, and toilet paper is gone again. It is hit the, hit, hit the road. I don't know where it went. I don't know why people stock up on it, but they're buying in bulk. And I think that's something you need to really consider. Um, it can be, you know, postcards. It can be thank you cards. It can be, uh, I have right down over here next to me, I have 2000 door knocker, door knocker hangers uh, that I bought that I haven't used obviously because of COVID, but um, I bought those in bulk because they got discounted rates. The reason why we like to buy in bulk and why you guys should consider doing it is because if you find something that works, then bulk up on it as much as humanly possible and double down. Now, this could be buying, you know, camera equipment for videos. It could be buying audio equipment for podcasting. It could be buying, you know, stationary. It could be buying postcards. It could be door hangers. Whatever works for you, just be real with yourself and stop chasing the, the, the shiny object because you know what? If the door knocker hanger works, why would you do a video? Because if that thing's getting you business, hey man, that's all that counts. If you're helping families, put money in your pocket, end of story. Bottom line is, where's your time best, best spent? This goes back to this notion of the opportunity cost. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's go on to number seven. When you drive, you spend money, time, and energy. And I'm hoping that sometime during the next year, the vaccinations are going to be out there. We're going to start returning to normal and people are going to be able to, to go back to coming into the office and conducting their business from their offices if they choose to. But the question is, to what extent do you want to do that? You know, do you want to continue to work from home or do you want to go back to the office? I know some people love there, but if you could cut say if you were going into the office five days a week and you can cut that back to maybe three days and you save 50 miles per week, well, the IRS mileage deduction for this year is 57 and a half cents per mile. So if you cut your mileage by 50 miles per week by working at home and then you do your errands before and after your appointment. So if you're going to go out, get everything done at one time and COVID's talk taught us this, you know, go out, get, you know, go out, get what you need and then get back then you can save almost $1,500 per year. And you also have a reduction in time and stress spent. Wow. You know, <clears throat> with the brokerage I'm with, I've been working from home prior to COVID. Um, and I'll tell you one thing, uh, the lack of stress that I've experienced by not commuting on a daily basis is substantial. Um, not to mention the wear and tear on my vehicle. Okay, now this next one is near and dear to our hearts. Cut market time by pricing your listings correctly. And I'm just going to say something very simple here. The shorter the time that your listings are on the market, the greater your profit will be because you'll spend less time and money on getting them sold. Enough said. Price them right. 
Yes. And we've done other shows that, uh, you know, on this issue of pricing or listings, right? But that is one of the huge takeaways that we can give today. You know what, Bernice? I completely agree with you. And you know what? My team and I, we've actually lost listings because we were honest with the sellers about pricing. Um, you don't want to buy your listings. You want to be honest with the, with, with the sellers because it does two things. One, it shows you as a professional. And two, it doesn't waste their time. And it doesn't tarnish your reputa uh, re reputation. Actually, there's three things. But I mean, it, it it, it, it just pays you back in spades to be honest, transparent, and, and a real human. So spot on on that one. Number nine, have clarity about what your buyers really want. And if you're not doing a buyer's interview where you take the time to find out what does the buyer want, what do they really need? And one of the things I've learned from doing um, buyer's interviews over the years is you get them to identify the top five things that they want to purchase. And yeah. that way, and if they're going to add something to us, then what comes out of that top five? Because what that does, it keeps the price from creeping up, but also it helps you, you know, do a better job of honing in on what they, you know, what they will ultimately purchase. And I'm going to give you a question that works really well here. Ask them about their favorite house from their childhood. And Greg, in our training, um, <laughs> we talked about this on our Listen, Sell, Real Estate Like Crazy program. And I actually interviewed you. I did a buyer's interview. And I asked you about your favorite house from childhood and then yep. how that matched up with what you would be looking for in your next house. And what did you discover? It was spot on. Minus a few little details, spot on to my, the, the house that I grew up in uh, for the majority of my life. It's a single level with, you know, pool and lots of windows and, you know, everything else and open floor plan. And, 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 and when Bernice, you know, she kind of showed that to me, I was like, holy macaroni, like that was an eye opener. And it, just try this, guys. It's insane how well this works. So again, just be aware of that. That's a great question. Tell us, tell me about your favorite house from your childhood. That's the one they're most likely to buy. Number 10, be proactive about seeking client feedback. One of the most important things that you can do to build your business is look for ways to improve it. And the best point in, in any transaction is when it closes, ask your clients, what could you have done better? Greg, you've been religious about doing this in your business. How have you gone about improving your business by seeking client feedback and testimonials? You couldn't be more spot on, on with this question because this is the one thing that people get very, very terrified to do because they don't want to be told that they're wrong. But in reality, guys, we all have flaws. And so I, I realized that a long, time about, a long time ago about myself. And so what I did is I, I asked the hard question. You know, I said in different parts of the, of the transaction, especially after the close, I said, Bernice, you know, I really enjoyed working with you. Thank you for your business. I appreciate you and Byron more than you know. Um, could I ask you a couple of questions? You'll say, yes, of course. And I say, okay, great. Can you tell me three things that I did incredibly well? And then can you tell me three things that I did incredibly poorly? And the reason why I ask this is because I want to improve my business and I want to make sure when I work with you next that I can be better for you. Would that be okay? And people, they'll try to be nice to you and say, no, I, I really need you to take the gloves off and I want you to be brutally honest with me. What did I do wrong in, my, in this transaction I could have done better, in your opinion? And then once you let them start talking, guys, some of the conversations you're going to have are going to hurt. They're going to, you're going to, you're going to hurt your ego and you're going to feel really bad about yourself. You might need to go get a glass of wine or a soda or whatever you like, or a cup, you know, piece of cake. But the thing is, is that you're learning. This is the greatest education you'll ever get because once you understand what you look like through their eyes, you all of a sudden have a different perspective and you're going to have the ability to be better on your next deal. And that's what we all really wants. You know what? You got to learn. You got to grow. You know, Greg, the thing I like is that you actually went after this at such a deep level because I would have asked, you know, what did I do right and what could I have done better? And you, and then you asked three for three things that where you didn't do well and they weren't, weren't going to tell you, but then when you dug down, you got the straight feedback. So you know, I want to encourage you to take a hard look at doing it what Greg just told you to do because it's very powerful and boy, is it going to help you to grow. So Greg, what are your final takeaways for our viewers today on how they can be more profitable in their business next year? 
Would it be more profitable in my personal humble opinion is I would go back, look at where you're spending your time and your money. And then I would go back and spend time with your clients, get reviews, post them online, do videos if you can, uh, get visibility with them. And you know, that's where I would spend my time. That's where I would be more profitable in 2021. It's super simple. And that's my takeaway. Bernice, what's yours? Mine is work smarter, reduce expenses, and always search for ways to make the best possible use of your time. So thanks for joining us today. See you next time.